Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Anthony. I'm here today with my colleagues, Justin and Kyle from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We're very excited and honored to be here today, especially in face of so many powerful thought leaders in this area. So we thank you for the opportunity. Now, before we get started, we would like to ask you to just, for a five second activity, if you would close your eyes and picture what comes to mind when I say the word water. Now, what did you picture? Did you picture rain, the ocean, a bottle of water, a swimming pool? And the reason that I ask and we do this is because we think it helps uh, illustrate um, and develop uh, a story, actually, a brief story that I'd like to tell you before we get started. And it really brings light the sentiment of our presentation and of our research today. So I have a niece who's eight months old, and I've been developing cue cards for her that have pretty simple images and words so she can begin to associate uh, things that are, she'll interact with in her early years. And you know, the, the images are things that are pretty simple, like cat, dog, tree, milk, and water. Now, I ran into the issue when I got to creating this cue card for water because I really didn't know what image I should use. What will my niece begin to associate water with now and as she grows older? And it begged the question of what is her association with water going to be in the future? What is water going to be like for her in the future? And even more importantly, what is water going to be for us as we move forward in the future? Now, we'd also like to thank, from the bottom of our hearts, Dr. Kyung Lee, who is our supervisor and professor who made this way from Dalhousie University in Halifax as well. Dr. Lee, as MBA students, he was the one who gave us the first taste of what data means, what it could look like, how, it could, how we could incorporate it into our lives and into our professional careers. So we were very appreciative of him and for being here today. Now, when we think about climate change, some of the biggest things that are spoken about and uh, introduced and discussed with climate change are certainly the rising temperatures globally. Um, and also harsh weather conditions. But less so is spoken about water quality and access to water uh, in the future. It is estimated that anywhere from one to three billion people in the world today lack access to safe drinking water and are living in water scarcity. As global populations continue to grow, we're looking at about 8.5 billion people by 2030 roughly 9.7 billion by the year 2050, and most of this population increase is going to be seen in developing nations. As such, we're experiencing dwindling natural water resources, and uncertainty continues to grow for governments and organizations on how we, they're going to handle this problem. And this isn't just an issue in developing nations. Here in the US alone, it is estimated that upwards of hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 30 years are going to be required to replace existing water infrastructure, particularly along the eastern, sea, uh, the eastern seaboard. So what our research looked to focus on was how access to safe drinking water is associated with things like infant mortality, GDP, and healthcare spending across different nations in the world. Now, the nations that we looked at represent two groups. So the G7 nations, which many of you are familiar with, and the next 11 nations. Now, while the next 11 doesn't represent a formal cohort of countries, it was a group that was identified in 2005 by Goldman Sachs as the emerging economies of the 21st century, aside from the BRICS nations. So these are the countries, 18 countries, that we use for the purpose of our research. Uh, I apologize, this doesn't appear to be the most up-to-date deck, but we 
we will come back to the major findings. We want to get into what our data set and variables look like. So the data set were from two particular open data sources. The first was Aquastat, which is the United, from the United Nations. And the second were data sets from the World Bank. And we took data from the years 1997 to 2014. And the main thing uh, that it is important to note that not all data was available for each country, particularly with some of the develop, uh, developing nations uh, across all the years. The predictive variable that we looked at building was the percent of population with access to safe drinking water. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Justin to walk you through our IBM Watson dashboard. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, so we chose IBM for a number of reasons. For one, it does have predictive capabilities. It also has natural language processing, so when you don't know what to do with data, you can ask IBM Watson and it'll give you some hints. And it was really excellent for that. And it's also cloud-based, so for collaboration. Although we are at the same program, we have different classes and different schedules, it was really easy to use IBM for those purposes. Unfortunately, IBM Watson is being migrated, so we lost access to our dashboard recently and we'll not be able to do a demo for you live, but we do have screenshots and we can explain in greater depth what we did, and there's also a YouTube video um, that goes into much more depth than what we'll be going into today. Um, it's unfortunate because we had all these cool things we wanted to show you, but I think we can give you the picture of it uh, regardless. So I'm going to show you, uh, you know, the starting of our future PhD thesis that as population increases, per capita internal water resources decreases. Well, duh, of course, that's a very obvious uh, statistic and a very obvious relationship and something that poses great risks to our society. What are we going to do now? Because we can't just invent more water. And uh, the, with the pollution, of, of course, that people are probably going to discuss in other presentations, this is going to put even more and more stress as things go along. So from a methodological perspective, I wanted to also explain that we looked at it in G7, X11. So if we had the dashboard fully functional, we would be able to show you flipping back between the two. But we've taken screenshots of both, so we're going to go between G7 and Next 11. As you can see, the trend in the top left corner will continue um, across uh, the Next 11 as well. But what I want to turn your focus to is things in the bottom left corner. Um, because it's, uh, it shows that internal water resources per capita, Canada is a leader, just like we have the most uh, gold medals in Olympic hockey history, um, and the U.S. is second, something we like to pride ourselves on. But if you look on the other side, in the bottom right, we see a relationship on that heat map between internal water resources per capita and GDP per capita, where the U.S. is a leader, just like they beat us in every other sport except for hockey. And, but we happily are in second place, though it's not necessarily the case. Winter Olympics, we do pretty good. The Summer Olympics, uh, not so much. Um, but in the top right corner, you get to see a little bit of, you know, our, our texts that we look at, like things like average internal water resources per capita. Now, of course, the presence of Canada on this kind of skews it. Of course, we're a big nation, lots of water. So it makes it look like, um, you know, there's quite a bit of a discrepancy when you look at G7 and X11. But even if you were to remove to Canada, there's, there's a, there are much more internal water resources per capita in the G7. On, uh, on average. But what we, one thing you do notice as well is that there is some sort of relationship between GDP per capita and internal water resources per capita. Now, when we go to the next 11, we see a very different picture. If you focus on the bottom right, you notice that that doesn't necessarily apply anymore. In fact, countries like South Korea, very highly developed country, does not have a lot of internal water resources per capita, but its GDP per capita is quite high. Take, on the other hand, in Indonesia. Indonesia has a lot of internal water resources per capita as a maritime nation. It's also one of the largest nations in Southeast Asia, but its GDP per capita is not as high. So we see this kind of like moving in two different directions. So what does this all mean? Well, we want to take a look at another major factor in our analysis, the government healthcare expenditures and how this kind of relates to water. So we're looking now at the G7. There's a bit of an outlier in 2014. Of course, this is after Obamacare, so government expenditures on health care have increased. And in fact, with all the G7, they've been increasing ever since. So that's something that's going to put increasing stress on future taxpayers as well as current taxpayers and on governments for making decisions. But what you do kind of see in this as well is that health care expenditures, um, countries that have higher health care expenditures tend to have less water. So Germany is a good example of this, Italy as well. Um, and this is something that actually continues as well across the next 11. Now, as Anthony mentioned, we don't have full data, and this is a limitation that Kyle will discuss in, uh, later. It's something that we have a recommendation that addresses as well. Um, however, you can see for even with the um, four uh, of the next 11 that we do have data for, there's a correlation to gain with internal water resources per capita and healthcare expenditures. So, if you look at it just from a perspective of access, and access again is the most important, because internal water resources per capita is one thing, but if everyone has access, then 
we're doing okay. So if you look in the G7, that's basically a fait accompli. Every single nation has virtually 100% access to safe drinking water, um, which is a very positive sign. So the conclusions of this slide are not actually all that useful for you because it doesn't tell you very much. But if you look on the next 11, on the other hand, we see again that trend that exists here. So Indonesia, again, very high internal water resources per capita, but there's not a lot of access. And they have very low GDP compared to the other nations within the, that sample size. Whereas South Korea, again, very little internal water resources per capita. However, everybody has access and GDP is, is uh, as well very high. So you kind of see where our point's getting here. Now, we did want to show you our analytics and predictive platforms live in demo. We do not have access. Unfortunately, the migration, as I mentioned earlier, has not allowed us to go back in. Um, but uh, we, we want to highlight that there's three things that our data set has, has told us. One, that a major driver is GDP. So there's some correlation between GDP and access to safe drinking water. The other one is rural population as a percentage of overall population, as well as the amount of cultivated land. So all three of these things do have some sort of connection with um, uh, economic development, and we were hoping to find more statistics in terms of healthcare expenditures with Next 11. Unfortunately, we, they do, those don't exist publicly, they're not available, and, and that's kind of one of the limitations of our predictive model here. Now, this is where we kind of tie everything all together, and right now we're showing you across the full sample set what we see as a relationship between access to safe drinking water, infant mortality, and GDP per capita. So as you'll notice, countries with um, ac virtually 100% uh, access to safe drinking water, have very low infant mortality, and they also have very high GDP. So this relationship is true across the entire sample size, and then we move over to the next 11, you see that's also consistent. Countries like South Korea, again, very high access to safe drinking water, very low infant mortality rate, and very high GDP per capita. So what it all boils down to is that access to safe drinking water really is a proxy and a metric for determining the overall health of an economy, and something that governments, um, you know, both in the G7, Next 11, BRICS, as well as all the other nations of the world, really have to focus on, because access to safe drinking water really makes a major impact in, very, in many, many different ways. I'll now pass it off to Kyle, who will discuss more of the conclusions and summarize our report. So I'm just gonna flip back to some of our major findings here. Okay, so we put together a little puzzle here to make it slightly easier for you to understand. There may be a couple pieces missing, but that's nothing that more data along the way can't fix, right? So the first thing that we want to point out is that as a population increases, the internal water resources per capita decrease. But more than that, less access to clean drinking water results in high infant mortality, and lower access to drinking water also re relates to lower GDP. If you look on a more macroeconomic level, healthcare expenditures, when safe drinking water is not available, also increase. And as well, between the G7 and the next 11, these phenomena are, are still, they're still exposed to the same underlying risk. So even if in the G7 there's more water security, the underlying risk, there's, there, they still have that same exposure. Um, and overall, these predictors working together symbolize and show that access to safe drinking water truly is a predictor of a nation's overall health. So bear with me while I flip forward a few slides here. Um, we want to talk, we want to point out two main limitations in our research. And the first was that there really is no recognized international standard for determining clean, clean drinking water. So clean drinking water in the G7 might be categorized or, or represented as something different than clean drinking water in the next 11 countries. And the second, is that there were just simple limitations in the inherent in our data sets, mainly coming from the next 11, just not having that research available. Oh, let me circle back. So that being said, we do have a few recommendations for moving ahead. The first one is to create an international governing body to set the guidelines and regulations, and ultimately to set universal water quality treatment standards. Another recommendation is more data collaboration, so more information gathering, working together in order to bridge those gaps in the data. Third, legal frameworks on a national level that will coincide with international standards to get every player on the same page and create consistency. And we also recommend economic incentives, so rewarding things like water conservation, 
um, incentivizing new technology, entrepreneurship that deals with sustainability and water treatment and water security initiatives. And lastly, we want to, we would recommend ongoing education on the subject matter, and whether that's to members of the public, to institutions, or to countries as a whole. Um, tying it back into what Dr. Charles talked about earlier, the importance of really stressing education and artificial intelligence and going forward relating that to issues such as sustainability, we feel like that can really be a, a, a strong stepping stone in the right direction and we hope that this presentation will be just that. So with that, we'd like to thank you for your time. We appreciate you bearing with us for this presentation and we'd like to open up the floor to any questions that you might have for us. So this is uh, Mohammed Bajwa from UMUC. Uh, I understand you, your model was develop access to the drinking water, the fresh drinking water. Now in areas or in countries where agriculture is highly developed, there's also a lot of use of fertilizer, pesticides, and pollution going on. And actually that has been responsible for a lot of pollution of the underground water, which otherwise was considered safe. Have you taken that into consideration as well? Um, some of the data that we looked at originally was um, relating to sanitation um, uh, processing plants and their capability in terms of how much water they deal with on an annual basis. Unfortunately, even for the G7, we didn't have enough information to look into that, and that would have discussed more the impact of things that would impact uh, the groundwater, such as fertilizers. So while we had some of that information for, um, let's say, the United States and Canada, for example, we didn't have it for Italy or France, and we weren't able to find it for any of the next 11. So um, there's definitely an impact, I'm sure. The literature that we've looked at does suggest that. We don't have any data on our end that we could use to kind of confirm or deny that, unfortunately. I didn't see any uh, t-tests or any sort of statistical correlations, so how did you make your conclusions? And also, the OECD has tons of healthcare data. I'm not sure that might have been useful to you. Yeah, uh, in terms of the OECD data, we didn't find enough of it for the next 11 countries. Again, we had them all for the uh, United States and all the G7 countries, as well as the four that we mentioned earlier, but we weren't able to find them for all of them, in, 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 in particular across that entire period on a consistent basis. So, for instance, I believe it was maybe Nigeria. It had uh, 2014, but it didn't have the years before that. So that made it a little bit more difficult. Um, and to answer your question about the T stats and the S stats, we didn't run those regressions or do that sort of analysis just because on the basis of the fact that, again, as we mentioned, some of our variables are not complete. Um, and so I guess we could have done them on a partial basis, but then we would have to explain that in a really complicated chart and uh, it might detract from the message we're trying to get across here. Does that answer your question? I guess I'm not sure how you made any conclusions at all without doing some sort of an analysis like that, so not really. It would have been through the drivers that occurred through the IBM Watson platform. And again, we didn't have access to, re to, to bring those up again, but the main conclusions that we made were based on the three drivers, um, and those were uh, you know, given certain uh, percentage of correlation through the IBM Watson platform, but we weren't able to pull that up again. IBM Watson, IBM Watson Analytics. Oh, yeah, sorry, we didn't, uh, I guess it was just for presentation purposes, the analytics kind of made it look um, a little bit too crowded, but yes, we use IBM Watson Analytics, we didn't use, which I guess is powered by IBM Watson, but uh, we didn't think we had to be too, too semantic about it, but. Yes. This, yep. Yes. 
Uh, yes, so that would represent um, the percentage of the population with access to clean drinking water as a whole. So this looks across both rural and urban. Um, so uh, th the full circle, which would be south, um, which would be like countries like Egypt and South Korea and all that, they would have 100% access to safe drinking water. Whereas countries such as like Nigeria and Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc., have, have less than 100%. Yes. Oh. Oh. Oh, you're looking, oh, you're talking about the driver's slide, this one here? No. Yeah, it's like people who just like running a race. It's like running a racetrack, you know, on the outer lane, you got to run more. So I'm a bit oh. confused about the, uh, the length of each I, arc length. I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, there's, um, it, it's, uh, each circle is out of 100%, so it, it's not on a value basis. Sorry, I, I misunderstood your question. Okay, thanks. Yeah. That's just the bill. You can't, with IBM, you can't change that. You can't, unfortunately, show, well, we could show it other ways. We thought that this would be kind of a cool and colorful way of showing it. <laughs> it shows all the countries, like, in a row, so that's kind of why we picked it. And I, and I can see why you'd say it's a bit, um, uh, we'll say, misleading. Unfortunately, it doesn't allow you to put, like, a subtitle on, like, Tableau or others that are a little bit more creative in this. Uh, it, it kind of comes stock, and you have to adjust it um, to the extent that you can. Yes. Uh very good job, guys. You've done a good job. Uh, nice slides, nice research, nice content. Uh, it's a more of a curiosity question to each one of you, like each one of you to answer this question. So as a result of this project, is there one thing that you learned that you did not know before, the power of analytics, or the actionable insights? I just want, to I want you to reflect on your own personal experience having done this project. Sure. Um, yeah, so for us, it was a good opportunity to get exposure to the software of IBM Watson Analytics and we really got to see the power of, you know, if you take raw data and just look at a problem from a big scope level and see the results that it produces, it's, it's really powerful stuff. And to be able to, you know, communicate that through great visualizations, that's just the, the applicability spans through so many different uh, issues and things that we can bring to attention that really do matter these days. Um, so that's one thing that really stuck out to me. And one thing that stuck out to me was, and I believe it was discussed in some of the earlier presentations, but you know, you can use a software like IBM Watson Analytics, and you you know come up with things such you know, including what some of the main drivers are, but you end up often sometimes asking even more questions based on some of the results that you gain, um, you know, than the answers that you were anticipating. So, um, and you know, getting back to some of the discussion on, you may find some correlation. I think you know, with with definitely some more time, some more data, and more robust analysis, we'd be hoping to answer more of those questions of causation as opposed to just correlation. And one thing that we learned, I think, um, on a very technical level is that while all models are wrong, some are useful. I'm not sure how useful ours is, but it, there's definitely some errors that are involved in it. And I think, uh, as, an, as a couple speakers here mentioned, I mean, 80% of the time is spent finding and curating data. We spent probably 95% of the time trying to look for data sources, going through everything possible, and we keep running into ruts. So one is like, we don't have the data for 1997, then we don't have it, for some reason we have 1997 and 2002, but we don't have 2012. Right? We don't know what's going on here. Or other ones that, if you actually read the footnotes, the footnotes tell you that they're calculated differently. Um, and that's a real frustrating thing and why the discussion of having consistent international, not only water quality standards, but data standards, as was mentioned earlier by another presenter. I mean, those are things that I think are, they become more and more important, I think, as time goes on. And uh, with the proliferation of you know, things like IoT and all that, we really do see an opportunity now, especially in this field, um, to really take things to the next level, but without some sort of standardization of how the data should be recorded, how it should be represented, how the factors should be calculated. Um, it's just kind of a bit of a mess. Um, so that's why I think while a model might be, a model is definitely wrong, it may still be useful. <laughs> all right, good job, guys. Let's give him a hand up. So, one, one, last, one last question. For those of us who are not familiar with the university, can you just say one or two things that we don't know about your university? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so, Dalhousie University is located in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Halifax is close to Maine. Uh, we are, we kind of, some people consider us to be the Boston of Canada. We like lobster, we like uh, clam chowder. Um, we don't like the Bruins, though. 
um, in case anyone's a Bruins fan out there. The university itself, especially for the maritime provinces, it's actually the only university that is a U15, so one of the large research universities within Canada. So it kind of stands out on the East Coast for, for that representation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you.